Owen, Gary Owen, Gary Owen. In this valley of Montana, all alone, there are better days to be for the Seventh Cavalry when we charge again for dear old Gary Owen. Hear that music? It's a song called Gary Owen. He was brought to this country from Ireland and became very popular during the Civil War. Later, it was adopted as a battle song by one of the most famous of all our regiments, the 7th Cavalry, a regiment which made history here on this hill. You may never have heard of Gary Owen before, but I know you have heard of one of the most famous members of the 7th Cavalry. His name was George Armstrong Custer. He graduated from West Point as a second lieutenant in 1861, just as the Civil War broke out. Two years later, at the age of 23, he was a brigadier general, the youngest man ever to achieve such a rank in the United States Army. Custer had a brilliant combat record with the cavalry in the Civil War. After the Civil War, Custer was assigned to a new regiment, the 7th Cavalry, which immediately took the field. And for a number of years, Custer led his men in many campaigns against hostile Indian tribes in the West. You find cavalry only in the history books now. Tanks and armored vehicles have long since replaced horses in our army today. But a hundred years ago, the U.S. Cavalry patrolled over thousands of miles of the West. Custer's career reached its climax here on this hill, for this is the site of Custer's last stand. These Montana slopes and hills may seem peaceful now, but on a June day nearly a hundred years ago, Custer and the men of the 7th Cavalry stood where I am standing, and they saw a sight which few men have ever seen and lived. This region was occupied by the Sioux and Cheyenne, they were powerful warriors, and here they made a final valiant effort to prevent the loss of their hunting lands. When the white men began to invade the Great Sioux Reservation, bands of Sioux and Cheyenne gathered together for protection. And they soon formed one of the most powerful Indian forces ever faced by the army. Great chieftains were present at a medicine lodge Sitting Bull announced that he had a vision and that the great power had told him that his enemies would be delivered into his hands. From the east, the west, and the south, three strong army commands marched on the Indian concentration in southern Montana. This is the battle flag carried by Custer's regiment on that march. Although the exact size of the Indian encampment is not known, there may have been as many as 5,000 warriors. Their camps extended for three miles along the Little Bighorn River. On the morning of June 25, 1876, Custer and his 7th Cavalry approached the encampment of the Indians in the valley of the Little Bighorn and sighted the smoke of the campfires. Custer decided to attack immediately and divided his command into three groups. Custer, with the largest unit, moved along the Little Bighorn River and was last seen by some of the other troops as he waved his hat from the bluffs above the river. He reached this ridge with about 225 men. No one can say exactly what happened here on this hillside. Brave Wolf, the fighting chief of the Cheyenne, was one who later described the final stages of the battle. Just as I got there, the soldiers began to retreat up the narrow gulch. They were all drawn up in line of battle, shooting well and fighting hard. But there were so many people around them, they could not help being killed. They still held their line of battle and kept fighting and falling from their horses. Fighting and falling all the way up, nearly to where the monument now stands. A part of those who had reached the top of the hill went on over and tried to go to the river but they killed them all going down the hill before any of them got to the creek. It was hard fighting, very hard all the time. I have been in many hard fights, 
but I never saw such brave men. The other companies of the 7th Cavalry were also attacked a few miles to the south of here and suffered heavy losses. They heard firing from this place, but it was not until two days later that a scouting party was able to reach this site. They found Custer and every one of his men dead on this slope. Their bodies were scattered over the ground with a general tendency toward the knoll where Custer was. On the knoll, we found the bodies of General Custer, Colonel Cook, Colonel Tom Custer, several enlisted men, and several horses, while lower down, just at the base of the knoll, were a great many enlisted men and horses. The defeat was total and it was the Indians' greatest victory. But a great mystery surrounds this field, for no one really knows what happened. Was Custer a hero, or should we blame him for attacking such a large force of Indians and losing every one of his 225 men? We shall probably never know the answers. These white markers which you see on the battlefield are not gravestones. They marked the place where the soldiers' bodies were found after the battle. Here is the place where Custer himself fell with two of his brothers. Scattered within this small area of the fence are markers for 52 men who fell all together. Looking down the slope towards the Little Bighorn River, I can see nearly 50 markers with a great number more scattered along Custer Ridge. After the battle, the bodies of the soldiers were gathered together and placed in a single grave on top of Custer Ridge. A memorial to the brave men of the 7th Cavalry was erected above them. Should you visit Custer Battlefield, or next time you see a painting of Custer's last stand, remember these words from the battle song of the 7th Cavalry. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.